if you looked at the newsletter, you'd notice that Chris's bio started with basically his retirement and moving to Sawasan. So I thought I'd just throw in about a really quick mention of the fact that before he retired, he was an executive in the electrical wholesale industry. Uh, he was general manager of Gascan in BC. And he probably picked up the travel bug because his last couple of years were spent in the Asia, excuse me, Asia Pacific region, living in Hong Kong and traveling throughout the region from Melbourne, Australia in the south to Shanghai, China in the north. So I think we know where Chris and Marlene for at least some of that time picked up that travel bug. So moving on to when he did retire, uh, Chris and Marlene moved to Sawasan in 2015, went on a birds on the bay walk, which of course are open to the public and joined Delta Naps shortly thereafter. He was a director with uh, Delta Naps for three years and I think he got tired of us. <laughs> so he <laughs> decided that he'd go on to other things. Um, but he's a very active member of the biodiversity team and the Delta Nats Program Review Committee and the Cascade Bird Box team. And he's also a director of Boundary Bay Park Association. So he keeps himself pretty busy. Um, in 2010, uh, Chris and Marlene bought a house in Arizona and most winters <laughs> they spend, or should say most springs they spend there and Chris has found that being with Delta Nats has really escalated his interest in nature. And Arizona, of course, provides a rich environment to, to explore nature and hone his photographic skills. He is a member of the South Delta Photo Club. He's an excellent photographer. And under normal circumstances, he and Marlene are very avid travelers. Uh, they had to kind of scoot home this year from Arizona and unfortunately have been stuck here since. Uh, they also hosted our 2017 and 2018 Delta Nats garden parties. So they're both great Delta Nats members. And I have to say on a personal level that Chris has been a very, very good friend to me over the last couple of difficult years. So now I'm gonna ask Jim or the ghost of Jim, who's now back to being a Finch again, <laughs> to start the recording. And we'll let Chris take us into the sunny Southern Arizona and see what he's been catching while he was wandering around there. Birds, butterflies, mammals, flowers. Go for it, Chris. Yeah, before I start the presentation, uh, we did, Marlene and I did buy a place in 2010. It was during the financial crisis. And we were, we were traveling with a fellow from um, who I worked with. Uh, he ran the prairies, I ran BC. And while we were there, he said he was thinking of buying a house. Were we interested in going in with him? And it took about five minutes. And we said, sure, <laughs> why, why not? And so this uh, journey into Arizona is a, is a result of that five minute conversation. I don't know whether we'd have picked Arizona if we just said, oh, we want to go somewhere warm, but we got the house, so why not? So uh, I'll start the screen. Uh, can you give me the screen, Jim? You should be able to share it, Chris. It says host, dis host is disabled. Uh, says one participant share at a time. Did you did you try it? Yeah, I've got share, the share screen at the bottom. Yeah, yeah it, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, give it a shot uh, now. That that would you be you, Finchy boy? Yeah, you want to give it a shot? <laughs> yeah. There we go. Okay, Jim, get the recording started. Got it. Got it? Yeah. Good. Oh, it's just not showing that it's being, okay. So uh, the 
title of this is uh, Wanderings in Southern Arizona, and I've just given you the little introduction. Um, the agenda, I'll talk a little bit about why we went to uh, Phoenix and what is about Phoenix and, and around there, and then talk about some of the birds and wildlife in the Phoenix area, and then go down to uh, my favorite area, which is in the southeast. Um, Gene Gardner, who I know is on this call, uh, and I have had uh, lots of conversations about this area. She goes down there a lot, or used to go down there a lot. And so she's pointed me in a few places, and there's a lot of places to go. Um, start off with the one picture uh, that I have of insects. So Terry, yeah, you have to feast yourself on this one. Um, this is a master blister beetle. They, Jim, Jim and I were out and uh, they were swarming. They were swarming on us onto some brittle brush flowers, which are a yellow flower. And these insects are quite large. They're up to two inches and they're quite bright. So you'd think that they'd be open for the birds and they would be eaten. But, but no, they, uh, when they're attacked, they pop a blood vessel in the leg which uses this yellow, uh, foul-smelling uh, liquid that, if you touch it, actually causes blisters, which is where the blister um, comes from. So the birds leave it alone. And uh, in the Phoenix area, they, at, at one point of the year when the uh, brittle brush are around, they, this, they swarm, not, not so much in the urban areas, but uh, in, the, in the bush. Interestingly, and I'm not going to dwell on reproduction, but it seems to be with different species that the reproduction um, give, give some interesting facts about the species. In this case, the female picks the male, um, and the male lands on the back of the female, and uh, the female will only take um, males that are larger than her. She, she has a, like a little weighing machine on her, and um, if he's lighter, then she rejects him. Uh, if not, she accepts him. And they're joined together for uh, 24 hours. And she keeps moving around and feeding and, you know, generally having a good time. So yeah. that's the end of my uh, insect talk. <laughs> so why Phoenix? I thought I'd talk about Arizona and before we start into pictures, just paint a picture of what Arizona is. And in order to do that, I quickly just compare to British Columbia. Uh, population Arizona is 7.3 million, um, BC is 5 million. Uh, the Phoenix area, the metro area is around 5 million and Tucson is 1 million. So that only leaves 1.3 million in the rest of Arizona. So it's a little like BC in terms of large, large cities and fragmented small population. It is though a third of the size of BC, but then BC has a lot of Northern territories. Um, I, also in population size, Phoenix is uh, the 10th largest city in the US. There's a number of them around five to 6 million and Phoenix is the, uh, is the 10th. And the next table, you can see the rapid um, population growth over the last 40 years when Vancouver has doubled in size in the last 40, Phoenix has tripled in size and uh, continues to go so. And they, all they do is they just keep pushing further and further out into the desert, which is shame in a way. And uh, the last one, there is a population mix. There's 30% Hispanic and uh, majority of people are Caucasian there. Just because of COVID is current times and people have asked me, uh, are you going down there? And we say, no, the, uh, the um, table I've just put in here shows the Arizona cases. Uh, there's been 567,000 cases and 7 million. That's 8% of the population has been affected. And there's been 9,300 deaths. Um, uh, this is Arizona as a whole, uh, but, but a lot of them are in uh, Maricopa County, which is, which is Phoenix. Compared to British Columbia, 
which is 54,946 deaths. That was as of this morning. Um, so you can see why we're not going down there, even though we might be able to get an injection down there. Well, was, it might be a time to get one here. I just put it, put it into perspective as to kind of how, how well um, the health departments are trying to do here. So here's a map of Arizona. Um, what we're going to, as I was putting this presentation together, I realized I had far too many places and far too many species. And if I tried to put lots of, I'd have, I'd overwhelm everybody with information and it, and it wouldn't be that entertaining. So what I'm, what I tend to talk to is the Phoenix area, which is this area here, and also the southeast piece, which is down here, uh, Bisbee, Sierra Vista, Nogales, that kind of area, and just dwell on those those two areas. Phoenix is very central um, in terms of you can get to the Grand Canyon here in, in four hours. You can get to San Diego over here in just over five hours. You can get to um, Las Vegas up here in about four and a half, five hours. And you can get to Los Angeles over here in six, six hours and over to Santa Fe in, in about five, five hours. So it's a pretty central area. Why Phoenix? Well, when we first went there, we weren't sure. Uh, probably the number one thing, and I'm going to talk to that uh, on the next slide, is, is the weather. Is all the, also the community. We're part of a housing or a Westbrook village, which is 3,500 houses. Our subdivision is 70 odd houses, and it's an over 55 uh, community. And, and uh, our particular subdivision is very active socially. Uh, there's some unique nature opportunities in, in Arizona in that it's such a different environment. It's, uh, it really is uh, totally, totally different than what we used to here. I've talked about the central location. One of the neat things down there is the living costs, and uh, Marlene loves the uh, free citrus, the the grapefruit at the top are from Bill and Peggy next door. The grapefruits are from another neighbor. Uh, the uh, the cost of, I don't think there's any tax on alcohol. Alcohol is very cheap, but also vegetables and meat, pre-COVID anyway, were very cheap. We could buy um, a, one of those six ounce punnets of for raspberries for 97 cents, whereas they're, three, they're $4 here. Uh, and meat, meat is on special, very, very uh, reasonable, and the taxes are fairly reasonable too. And so there's lots of opportunity to have uh, lots of adventures. It, the city itself is, um, how to put, it, it doesn't have bunches of tourist attractions. Uh, it has a lot of sporting. This is uh, the uh, Seattle Mariners. Uh, their spring training camp is quite close to us. This, they uh, share it with San Diego. So if you like sport, if you like golf, there's lots to do. If you're a visitor, maybe not so much. There are things to do. There's, a, there's the uh, uh, botanical gardens and the zoo and wonderful uh, music instrument, world-class music instrument uh, museum. Uh, but there is a lot of wildlife. This is a... Just a quick picture to illustrate, the, the, that's the house, the top middle one. The bottom one is the uh, living area. We inherited this red couch. The previous owner left it, so we decided we either throw it away or incorporate it, so we incorporated it. The house has a narrow, back, narrow yard, uh, so the house fills a lot of the yard, but then people don't. One, gardening is not, uh, is, uh, not as prevalent as it is here. You notice on the, the they have a lot of uh, Mexican gardeners come around and maintain the front, and you see they only seem to be able to prune stuff in rectangles. It's quite strange. I took this picture after a massive pruning. Uh, normally, as it grows out, it's uh, a little better than that. But there's a pool area and nice sunsets and lots of people to socialize with. 
So I talk to the weather and I think the weather is a lot of the reason why people go south. And if we uh, go over to the far left uh, table, you can see the hours of sunshine in Vancouver. January is average is 60. I don't think we're going to do that this year, but um, in Phoenix it's 248. And you can see the comparison. So there's considerably more sun and there's the days with pre precipitation um, this one here, you can see it, it only is four days in January, four, four days in, in February. Uh, here, I think we've had five days so far. Um, the total uh, rainfall for uh, Phoenix is eight inches. And the in Vancouver, it's around 57 to 60 inches. So considerably drier and considerably more sunshine. There is in the um, July August time what they call them they call them the monsoons there, and uh, although the uh, the average or the uh, precipitation isn't that great, it seems to all come down over a very short period. I was there in July 2019, and it was wet. There were warnings going out not to go on the freeway. There was that much rain, so. Because there's only eight inches of water, that really affects the wildlife. And obviously with the sunshine, that affects the, the uh, desert. So water for wildlife becomes the most important uh, thing. So if you're looking for wildlife, mammals, birds, insects, whatever, some, some species like the hot, arid desert, but a lot of them follow the rivers. Uh, the one on the right is the Hasayampa, which actually shows as a river uh, on the Arizona map. I don't have the San Pedro here. I have pictures of that later. Um, the The one on the far left is a uh, is um, just north of Tucson in the mountains there, and that's probably the widest. Um, piece of river that I've seen apart from the Salt River, which runs to the south of Phoenix. So water is at a premium and water is so important for wildlife. Phoenix is about a thousand feet uh, high. It's about a thousand feet there. And so it gets quite hot in the, uh, in the summer. A lot of people that'll have a place in Phoenix that are retired also have a place in places like Flagstaff, which is at a 7,000 feet level. So it's it's cooler, a lot cooler up there. And the place that I'm going to talk to, Sierra Vista, is at the 40, 4,500 uh, foot level. So again, it's a little cooler than Phoenix. It's still hot, um, but it's but it's a little cooler. This is the kind of topography you get. The top left one is uh, is Sedona, uh, which I'm not going to talk to in this thing, but there's a lot of red rocks up there, uh, neat area. And the, the ones with the sequoia here are uh, around uh, uh, Phoenix. And uh, then there's also some plain lands, the sum down uh, near Sierra Vista, and there's also some to the east of uh, Sedona, where you have the mountains and then you have this nice arid area. And the picture on the bottom right is a picture of me pulling in my gut for the photograph. So the Phoenix area. Not going to go, there's so many places I could talk to. The, the, um, this, this is where we live. It's in an area called Peoria, which goes up and down. And the ones with the X's are the ones that my favorite areas to go to. Hasayampa is uh, probably one of my favorites and Gilbert Water Ranch is another one. And over here is the Boyce Thompson. But there's also like Metro Van have regional parks. So does Maricopa County have parks. And there's Buckeye and Esterelda and White Tank and Dow. So there's a number of wilderness parks to get out to. There aren't too many in the middle. There is, there is a small area uh, Thunderbird Park close to us, which has has a fair amount of wildlife, but the better ones are uh, outlying. And, and there's a whole bunch of other places that I could have marked, but it would be overwhelming. So 
Jim and Patty came to stay a couple of couple of years, and in one month, I I saw 101 species. That was when they were there, and when we went down south, and then I was I was out by myself, so I, I did get over 100 species. Peter Peter Ward, who's on this call, came down last year in February, and uh, and we just did the Phoenix area, and we saw 74 species. This is us at the uh, entrance to uh, Hasayampa, and it's in February. Uh, it's about um, five degrees cooler up at Hasayampa because it's higher, uh, and so it was a little cool enough that you had to have uh, long pants on. The background in the in the Jim and Paddy picture is the White Mountain um, Park. And this would be typical of the of the desert type uh, landscape. So in our backyard, uh, we have a number of birds in the backyard. I'm only going to talk about this one. This is the gambles quail. Uh, they are forever around. They're almost like pets. Uh, we do feed them, which is probably why they're always around. Um, we do find they bang on the patio window, and we're not sure if it's reflection or whether they want food. It seems that they only bang when we've started feeding them, so we're assuming it's food. And they do rear young. The young, quite amazing, because they you can see how small they are, but they can actually fly. And this this uh, wall is about six feet, but they manage to get up and down off the wall. Cute. The babies can fly six feet up in the air. So, um, so these are some of the common air Phoenix area birds. There's the thrasher. Um, there's a number of different kinds of thrasher, and I've probably seen them, but they're a little bit like the shorebirds. It's hard to tell one from another because they're all brown. They've all got the curved beaks, um, but they're offered in the backyard. The northern mockingbird is always in the backyard and occasionally the grackle. Uh, these are noisy, noisy birds that if you ever go south, you hear them in the car parks. Um, also reasonably, the verdin is very uh, common area. It's about the size of a um, chickadee. And the um, gnat catcher, uh, not so common, but uh, uh, there are two kinds. Uh, this is the black-tailed. Say they Out, yeah. Outside of uh, Phoenix is a uh, uh, red cardinal. They they don't. I haven't seen one in the urban area, but just outside in the parks, they 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 are all over the place, and we have lesser goldfinches everywhere, just as we have the American goldfinches uh, here. And another common bird would be the cactus wren. They tend to be about the size of thrushes. Uh, often seen sat on top of cacti. Uh, more birds, uh, the abbot's toey, um, rock wren, the ash-throated flycatcher. There are a number of flycatchers in Arizona and they're quite hard to get one to the other. So if I have misidentified them, I'm sure that Jean, you'll you'll let me know. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then there's this black one here. <laughs> one day I'm going to learn how to pronounce it. This too is outside. It's not in the urban environment, but it, it's it's around in that uh, that area. All sorts of different kinds of sparrows. I, I put four of them here. I've got another two or three uh, that we really don't see here. And uh, the black chinned is probably the more common one in the uh, in the park area. Uh, these are a little rarer, but uh, it's interesting because here I have difficulty telling white crown from gold crown from song sparrows from wherever. But there, they, they're quite distinguished one to the other, although every now and then I still get confused. This is an interesting bird, uh, the Harris hawk, and this this lamppost is about um, 
uh, 500 meters from the house. It's, it's on the main street just outside of the complex. And the Harris Hawk, um, this is Arizona here, so you can see it's just in the southern uh, area. It's an interesting hawk in that um, it's a community-driven bird. And there's a few animals that are community-driven, but it, it, when it hunts, it hunts. You often see them in pairs or in threes, sometimes fours. And when it, when it hunts, uh, they hunt together. So they get their uh, prey by one scaring it and then the other one picking it off. And the reason they're in the urban environment, because we've got two golf courses around it, so it's an open environment, is because there's an awful lot of doves and 50% of its diet in the urban area are doves. And so they'll hunt the doves all over the place. Um, even though they hunt in two or threes, there's a hierarchy as to who eats first. So the oldest one gets to eat first, and then on down, and the others sit by and watch until the until the, they've gone down through the pecking order. You do see Harris hawks here. I know that when Jack did a uh, photo thing at um, Camage House, there uh, we had a um, a raptor place bring some raptors out, and they had a Harris hawk because they're good for uh, shows. They're uh, quite tame and quite uh, trainable. But uh, again, quite rare. It's there in Texas as well, but really just Southern Arizona. And that as, as we go south is a hallmark of, of uh, what this is about. A lot of these birds, a lot of these animals are, are only in that area. Beautiful bird, I, I did it. Uh, I put it on a slide all by itself, the Western Bluebird. Again, they're out, outside of, uh, of Phoenix to the east. Um, you catch them at certain times of year as they're migrating through. And then a couple of the flycatcher family, the Phoebes, uh, the Says Phoebe and the Black Phoebe. The Black Phoebe um, is, is a water um, bird or water driven bird, it hangs around streams. The says is more open. Um, but the And they each from pick three to four areas to perch on, and they just flip between the, the three. There was um, a black Phoebe on the dike, I think about three months ago, four months ago, from um, uh, at 64th. But the black Phoebe is uh, fairly common down there, particularly if you go to a water area, you'll probably see one. And they're the fun birds photograph because they actually pose, as you can see this one did, as, as does the says Phoebe. Couple of um, commoner woodpeckers uh, all over uh, Arizona is the ladderback and the gila. Gila looking a bit like um, northern flicker. And both of these come into the yard. Um, both of them are fairly common out in the out in the brush as well. The great horned owl, um, not necessarily an Arizona bird. In fact, it's all over North America. I show this one um, to show you how it adapts to the habitat. It, in this one, it's in a sequoia uh, cactus, uh, and uh, it's some of the spines are quite prickly, but it seems to adapt. And uh, this particular bird has been nesting in this spot for about five years in a row now, uh, and it's well, well photographed. And it's not far off the uh, main freeway going north-south, the 17. So it's uh, an urban bird as well as um, has uh, well as nesting basically any anywhere all over North America. Although it's kind of interesting though to have it in the uh, cactus. Turkey vultures. Um, there's a lot of turkey vultures in Arizona, and uh, also um, black vultures. The black vultures have a black head rather than the the pinky head, uh, and the black ones tend to hang out with the um, turkey vultures. They uh, 
this this one uh, settled quite close to us when we were out, and uh, so got a reasonable close up picture. Uh, they spend a lot of their times like cormorants spreading their wings, either to uh, heat up uh, first thing in the morning when it's uh, they'll spread it to to get the sun in or to cool off after a day um, soaring up there in the clouds. They use the thermals a lot, and we've seen them here. But but there they can be large flocks. Uh, when we were staying in Patagonia, there were in the five or six very large cottonwoods outside our our uh, accommodation. There must have been 200 of these. And when they take off in the morning, they don't all take off at the same time. It's over like a two to three hour period and they're, as they're waking up and warming off. There's also a fair number of water birds, which you wouldn't think of in uh, Phoenix. There's two main areas for that. That's the Glendale Recharge Ponds, uh, which is by some big sports uh, stadiums. And that's like Iona. There's only four ponds. Uh, there are about 10, each pond is probably five to 10 times the size of the uh, Iona ponds. It makes seeing the birds a little hard in the ducks tend to be a little skittish in the US. I guess they don't like being hunted too much. So they tend to go to the other side of the pond and you often need a scope to uh, see them. Um, but there are large, because there are large bodies of water, we also get uh, numbers of ducks. And part of the 74 that Peter and I saw would be things like northern shoveler and widgeons and mallards and, and yellow legs and so on. But there are some different ones. White pelicans come through, they're seasonal. Uh, as is the white-faced uh, ibis. I don't know why they call it white face because it's brown, but that's maybe sex. Also down there are a lot of green herons. There's probably are as many green herons as we get uh, great blue and, and vice versa. You don't see many great blue herons down there, but, but there are there are quite a few green herons. And in the golf course near us, there's there's often three or four sitting by the side of the uh, golf course uh, as there is uh, other ducks. And therefore, because there's so many occasionally, you get a you get an up close and personal uh, photograph. I happened across this guy uh, early one morning and uh, he I think he saw me about half a second after this, just after I'd, I'd hit the shutter uh, because he was only about five feet away. Um, nice looking birds though. Lots of ducks, as I said, a lot of our regular ducks. Um, the ruddy duck up here is interesting because it's in its breeding, it's got its breed, the male has its breeding beak on. Uh, its beak changes color from uh, March till August. I don't think we see them with the with the blue uh, beak here. We do see cinnamon teal here. There was one in, or there was a pair in the pond at um, Boundary Bay. Uh, but this one, um, there there are a lot more of them in uh, in the water there, and, and so you see them a lot more frequently. Whereas they 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 tend to be more of a rarity up here. The common meganza we, we see, but uh, the reason I put these in is because I've never seen such large flocks. Um, just past where I took this pair, uh, there's a pond and I, I counted about 250 of them all, all at one place, all, all going through. And we don't have the coot. Sorry, there is there are coots down there, but there's more of these puppies. Beautiful looking bird, um, the snowy egret. Uh, it's, a, it's a smaller of the egrets. So it's, um, uh, egrets can be quite large, but incredibly fluffy and incredibly photogenic. And they do, um, then they're not too shy. And so, and they strut around and pose for you. And they're quite, quite good to take photographs of. This one was at uh, the Gilbert Water Ranch. 
This too was at the Gilbert Water Ranch. And we don't get them here, but uh, black neck stilts tend to be all over the, the southern US. And uh, f f again, most outings when you go out, if you're in water, you get to see some of these guys. The Osprey, interesting, this was at the Glendale Recharge Ponds. Um, and in, in those recharge ponds, I've seen Northern Harriers, Bald Eagles, Osprey, and this is heavily urbanized. There's um, a lot of, uh, say, sports uh, arenas uh, next to the 101. There's, there's like three or four of them all in one big complex. So all of the major teams all play there. And, and you can see this in the, in the not too distance, but the Osprey still goes around and he's feeding off fish from the uh, recharge ponds. This is uh, interesting. This was cliff swallows. And I was walking one day uh, by these recharge ponds and this swarm of, uh, of cliff swallows came towards me and, and landed. And I thought they were after some kind of food. When I read about them for this, what, they, what is, um, cliff swallows mate in, in pairs and they mate while they're building a nest and having the young. So they will uh, build a nest on the side of the cliff using pellets or whatever. And then they, they form a pair. And when the nest is half built, they, one of them starts to sit on it and the other one carries on uh, doing the nest. And, and so they have their young and, and wherever. But when they're not uh, nesting, when they're uh, out and about, they're a highly social group bird, so they f fly around together. And apparently, in my research, they really don't mind who they mate with. And I, so I don't think these guys are feeding. If you look at this pair down here, uh, I don't think they're feeding. I think they're doing something else. And there's another guy coming in to join in and there's a whole bunch down here. So I think we've actually happened upon a cliff swallow orgy. And uh, so I thought I'd share that with you because I and look at the action, look at the way the birds are all flying in. There are a lot of uh, shorebirds. I've just got a few here. Um, Long-billed dowager, of course, we know. But there's the least sandpiper and the avocets and, and a solitary sandpiper. Also, there's spotted sandpipers and yellow legs and so on. Um, so for an inland, I wasn't expecting as many shorebirds from an inland uh, area, but they're there. Uh, I wanted to outdo David and uh, Noreen on their hybrid duck. Um, I named this one the Kardashian hybrid duck. I'm not even sure what it is. I think it's, I'm not sure what breeds with what, but this one has bred with a lot of different things, I think. Um, and I think it might even have been a goose of some kind and a duck and wherever. And where it got this tough from, I don't know. I've seen this bird um on a number of different occasions so it's still around i talked before about uh the northern area and i'm kind of staying off specific areas at least in the phoenix area because it'll get a little repetitive but the hasse emperor is quite interesting because i did see a, a unique mammal for me anyway but this this would be indicative of the of how wide the Hasayampa is. And you can see here the banks. So when it does flood, when it does rain, then the river rises and this can be a torrent. Um, and then it deposits gravel and, and then all the grass starts coming back. Uh, so the river is normally very low, but when there's a monsoon or when it's it, the river rises and a whole bunch of stuff happens, river changes course. But there's, there's some different species up there. Uh, I saw a Lucy's warbler up there, ash fronted flycatcher, and, and the good old hermit, hermit thrush. Um, and so there's a, there's a few different species go there. 
Uh, it's a good place in the summer or the late spring, early summer. Uh, the vermilion flycatchers come in to nest there. This is the female here and the male. Um, quite bright. It's you almost have to adjust your exposure when taking a photograph of it because the red comes over uh, too too bright. Fairly common up there and fairly common down south as well, but always fun to see the first ones of the season. This is the um, animal that uh, saw uh, last um, this year or last year, 2020. Um, it was in Hasayampa, walked around a corner and there was a badger. I'd never seen a badger before. And I didn't know the badgers uh, existed that far south, but they do apparently. I'm trying to try to find out the number of badgers in North America, and it's a little hard. You can find out the the oddball ones, but uh, but because they're nocturnal, you don't normally see them. And this one was making a hell of a mess of some river banks, and it was, I think, uh, sleeping in there, but also feeding uh, feeding in there. Just after seeing this, uh, also saw but didn't get a picture of it, was a mountain lion, uh, which was quite exciting. But it was more of a blink of an eye, and it was behind a bush, but you could see the outline. But uh, try to take a picture, it didn't make any, not worth showing. So I promised a few other things. We've been very bird-centric so far. So in... Um, most of these pictures have been taken in the around the Phoenix area, and, and there's a few from the southeast, but uh, I put them together. So the first one is wild horses. There's about 500 wild horses. Uh, these horses, um, about 500 of them, they came up, they're descendants of some horses that the Mexicans brought with them in the 1800s. And they live in the Salt River Plain, uh, which is uh, east of Phoenix. Uh, it's only about 25 kilometers outside of Phoenix. Uh, they're fairly easy to see. The, the best time to see them is when you're not looking for them. If you're looking for them, they all seem to disappear. Um, and you can get some pretty good photographs, as the, the one on the right, if you hang with them for long enough. Um, I have a friend who's got pictures of them running through water and... Uh, they're fairly tame, but there's 500 of them and there's a protective society because they were going to cull them and, and so on. But they're interesting to see. Also around there are some desert flowers and, um, and cacti. And I talked to individual ones here. Uh, this is um, Stinknet. And uh, this is my buddy, Tanju, who's an avid photographer, not so much a wildlife photographer, but he likes getting out and about. So we go out on different journeys and uh, show you some pictures of some off-roading that he got me into. Um, but there's a lot of other um, desert plants out there. Here we've got chicory, uh, the brittle bush. The, this is the plant that that insect uh, likes to land on. This is uh, when the flowers are in are in bloom. The the flowers don't come out every year, or they come out every year. But to get good displays, it needs a good rainfall in the October November time to germinate the seeds. Otherwise, the seeds stay dormant for quite a few years. But when they do come, and there is enough rain, then the desert in certain areas can pop alive. And these poppies, sometimes known in California as California poppies, in Arizona, I think they're known as Mexican poppies. And there's other plants as well, all, all adding to the, and they tend to all be in the same area and interspersed with the cacti. You don't think of a desert as being green. Of course, if you went on another two, three months, this, this will be all brown and um, there wouldn't, the grasses would have all died. There's large numbers of cacti that come in. The, the desert flowers tend to come in in um, uh, mid-March till the end of April. 
the cacti tend to come in from mid March to mid May. They go a lot, a lot longer with different species coming on at different times. Um, this is, these are quite beautiful when, when you get them all over a large cacti. Um, there's a different kind here. And then you got this cigarro, <laughs> easy for me to say, cactus. This is the tall one and they come out multiple flowers. Um, they, um, some of the natives cook, cook these flowers. I'm not sure how they cook them, but uh, beautiful, beautiful cacti flowers. If you go to the um, Boyce Thompson or to the um, des the uh, botanical gardens, there's often large, large numbers of cacti all in flower at the same time. Quite beautiful. Another thing uh, I happened across, and it's only been this year since the brochures that I've got, I've kind of gone off of, not off of birds, but I realize that there's other things around. But while I'm out and about, if there was a lizard, I would be taking pictures of it, may take it and store it. And so for this presentation, I went through and I actually found five lizards and I thought they'd be, all be the same. I was quite surprised when uh, only two of them were the same, and these these were the four uh, different ones. I've subsequently found another one, um, and uh, managed to get on iNaturalist and uh, look these up. Quite unique. Lizards are quite fascinating. There's 49 species in Arizona of lizard, of which I have four, so I'm 10% of the way there. Uh, the one on the bottom, the eastern collard, I believe it does change its collar, um, color, I believe this, uh, to its environment. You can see here it's a little bluey on the rock, and I think it's changed it to being a little blue. Not 100% on that, but I'm pretty sure. Also, in 2019, in the summer, I went down in... Um, for the first time in July, because our partner in the house uh, decided to get married and wanted out of the house. So I had to change documents. And uh, in doing that, I would go out and I would um, uh, I, 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 well, sorry, I decided to go out, even though it was very hot. And I went specifically, I went south. And as I was going there, I noticed around noon that there were a lot of dragonflies around everywhere. And so I started taking pictures of dragonflies, in part because the birds, it was too hot for the birds. They seemed, they seemed to disappear or they seemed to vaporize. But the dragonflies are around. And so I started practicing um, taking pictures of dragonflies. And there's... A, a very large number. I, it's like 200 varieties of, of dragonflies down there. I'm, I've a, I have a ways to go yet. Um, but as we found out from, or Terry found out, identifying dragonflies is quite hard. They, there's, they can almost look exactly the same and be a totally different um, species. But here's, I have a, quite a few more, but here's an example of five. Lots of dragonflies. Lots of lots of neat hot days. They're they're buzzing and they actually settle because dragonflies are hard to photograph when they're flying. Also butterflies. I started taking pictures of butterflies. I think that started up on one of our trips with Tom up to um, uh, Mount Baker, where there's a lot of butterflies up there. So I have been, and these are six of them. Um, again, there's a large number of different butterflies, different ones. The um, swallowtail on the bottom here is interesting. It looks like it's out of focus at the bottom here, but you can see the head's in focus. And this guy uh, shimmers. It, it, its, its wings go back. As it settles, it doesn't open its wings. It just shimmers backwards and forwards, and it's almost iridescent. And so I had to put the speed up to get this and take a number of shots to get one that was actually open. But some beautiful these uh, buckeyes, quite quite beautiful. And there's uh, there's a couple of different kinds. They look very similar. But but lots of butterflies. Uh, most of these were taken at Boyce Thompson uh, Arboretum. 
uh, which is a place I really enjoy. Tanju, uh, the guy with the in the flowers there, got me into off roading in that he's a photographer and so with so is the gang that he goes with. There's about ten guys and uh, two cars. The guy here is the prime guy, and um, this is a, a trip. I'm actually in the back of this thing, and we're we were on two wheels at one point. Uh, a little scary. This is this. The actual picture was up near Sedona, uh, but you can see the guys are into photography. This is Mel. It was his 80th birthday on the day that we uh, we took this, and uh, there were uh, four of us. They're all into um, landscape photography and nature photography, and they they do enjoy the off roading. Uh, this this uh, forerunner was brand new uh, when he bought it you to look and it's only like two years old to look at it it looks like a wreck he's scraped the sides and he has laptop in there and follows the trails it's it's quite interesting what it does do is it gets you into areas that regular folk wouldn't go and you do need um, a permit to go into the different off-road areas so here's a, one of the views that we took not so much, there's a few birds around, but it's more landscape. And uh, you get views like this, uh, views like this. The guys are very keen, so you, you tend to meet at dawn and part at dusk. So it's a 13, 14 hour day, which is actually quite long. They like to take the sunsets. Um, but uh, you get some beautiful, beautiful views and you see things that most people wouldn't see. The unfortunate thing with that, with the trails, is a lot of them are the old mining, going to old mining camps or old farms, or their trails cut in the desert. And there's an increasing uh, sport in the US of getting four wheel drives um, like boondug buggy type ones and seeing how fast you can tear around the desert. And and so there's there's a real issue between off-roading as we would do it with taking pictures and, and stopping and staying on the roads and these guys that uh, run all over the place. So it's there's quite the controversy uh, going around. And then when there's meetings, when the uh, naturalists get into these meetings, then it can get quite fiery apparently. So that kind of concludes the area, uh, the phoenix and the, and the other species thing. One of my favorite areas is this southeastern Arizona area. And uh, I think it's very exciting. I always, I always get a wow. I always see different things when I'm down there. And this is a IBA map important bird area map and here is tucson and here is sierra vista here's a place called bisbee patagonia so tucson tucson south is a big big birding area and particularly this area here um, and, but there's also other birding areas here. I haven't spent much time here and I haven't spent much time here. I have spent a little bit of time um, in Madeira Canyon. Uh, but quite, quite interesting, quite mountainous. Um, and I show the picture of the bird book because there's a bit of a wow for me. Um, you know, I've taken pictures in the Falkland Islands and in in Peru and in other areas, but they're not in, I don't see those, I have to look those up. But for me, these are birds that are in my Sibley's bird book that I use all the time. So I get a particularly particular thrill from seeing something that uh, I wouldn't have normally see uh, where we are. And the other thing is there's a large number of species that are only in this area there might be in other areas as well but there's quite a few that are only in this area this one uh, you can see is a very low for those of you that are on eBird a very low count um, this is actually um, 
a Lucifer hummingbird that I'll show you a picture of in a while. So Sierra Vista, I think it was advertising itself as the hummingbird capital of the world or something. Uh, I don't like Sierra Vista. It's a military town. It's it's li fairly large town. It has a lot of uh, motels, hotels, um, a, a lot of uh, chain U.S. restaurants and the like. It's it's good because it's very good birding all up and down here. I like to stay in Bisbee, and I'll talk to that. And and uh, also been to Patagonia a couple of times, and I'll show you that. Bisbee has a population of about uh, 5,000, Patagonia about 800. I'm not sure what Sierra Vista is. It's probably about 60,000. Patagonia. So here's the Patagonia Hilton. The problem with Patagonia having 800 people is that accommodation is sparse. And when we booked this, I was with uh, Marlene, Jim, and Paddy. This is a double wide um, painted in... Um, Seattle Seahawks uh, colors. Uh, the there's limited there's limited Airbnb, particularly when you book at the last minute. This was f unique, funky, different. The price was right. Um, I don't think there were two pieces of furniture or two pieces of cutlery that matched, but it didn't matter. Uh, we were uh, within walking distance of the Hummingbird Center, and we had. We had all of these vultures outside of our uh, of our place, but this is this is the accommodation. I actually stayed in one a little smaller as a sister to this one when I went down there by myself in July. So hummingbirds. I got the Patagonia hummingbird center here, and if I've got a little X in that picture, it wasn't taken in uh, in in the hummingbird center. So the hummingbird center is. Uh, an old house that uh, a couple had uh, that put hummingbird feeders out and invited people in. And then when they passed on, the Tucson Audubon Society bought it and keep it as a bird sanctuary. So it's a, a fairly large lot. They have a, they have a butterfly garden uh, and they have chairs and benches you can sit on. And, and, and it's not only for hummingbirds, the other, other species come into the garden. Um, I'll show you a few hummingbirds now. One of my favorite because they are they like to pose. Uh, this is the broad-billed hummingbird, um, pretty bird. Uh, I have a second picture of the broad-billed hummingbird. It's, uh, again, very pretty. Um, this is uh, what I know as the magnificent uh, hummingbird, which I could remember. And uh, they changed it about three years ago to Rivoli's hummingbird. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long, it's a, it's a large hummingbird, and it has this, this white patch um, by the eye. Uh, again, very pretty bird. This, of course, is, uh, they go everywhere. We have them in our feeder the today at home. Um, but this is uh, our good old Anna's, but I got a nice close up. Uh, the black chin hummingbird, it has a bit of a purpley uh, chin here, but uh, again, not too common. Uh, you do see them down there. This one um, is uh, the violet crown and it's fairly rare. Uh, at least for the US. You can see the violet on the top. And this area here, with the, this is from a eBay map, so the darker the area, the more frequent. This is actually the Patagonia. These would have been seen in the Patagonia Hummingbird Center and the Sonita Creek um, Center, which is about three kilometers south. Um, so pretty rare. Um, not too frequently seen apart from around this area. And even this dark one is, you know, there's, there aren't a whole bunch being recorded. And a good old Rufus hummingbird. Uh, I included these because I, I like the, I like the close-ups, but the Rufus are all around. We get them here, of course. Uh, nice bird. And here is the Lucifer hummingbird. And you can see 
this is Arizona here, and it just dips into this little corner down here, and also a little piece of Texas. And in a bird book that I had, it, it, an Arizona bird book, it said it hadn't been recorded for um, for uh, 50 years in Arizona, but it does go to one place. It doesn't go to the Hummingbird Center. It goes to Ash Canyon, which is near Sierra Vista. And I'll talk to Ash Canyon a little bit in a minute, but I thought I'd include it with the hummingbirds. It's, you can tell it's Lucifer because of its, its beak here and its pieces coming down. And that's the one where eBirds only got 8,000 sightings and 2,000 photographs or so, which for those of you who don't use eBird is, is a, a fair amount. Just south of um, the Hummingbird Center, which is why we like um, Patagonia so much, is this Sunita Preserve. And also south of that, there's a state park, which has a lake and, um, and boats and camping and uh, all sorts of other things. But I've got a combination of pictures here. These pictures are from the Sunita Preserve and the mesquites are not uh, out yet. But you can see it's meadows and, and a lot of different uh, birds there. I haven't listed them all, but I have a few of them for you. Oh, just a few mammals first. Uh, the coyote um, are all over, uh, round tail ground squirrel all over, uh, desert cottontail. We even have some of those in our uh, backyard at, uh, in Phoenix. And uh, these white tailed deer I saw in, in the park. You can see there's a mountain lion warnings, and I was in the in the uh, uh, Sinita State Park, uh, the Patagonia State Park, and I'd seen this, and so I was a little nervous. I was just by myself, and um, so, and I'm in the bush, uh, or I'm in on a trail that's a narrow trail, and I can hear this crashing um, around me, and I'm getting more and more nervous. And then, I th and then the crashing, it came closer and closer. And then all of a sudden, it came into view. And I thought, oh, and here it was. It was a cow. And uh, my heart stopped uh, beating. And so what happens is because uh, cattle need water, so what you find is in some of these nature reserves, the Hasayampa is one, and the state park, uh, the cattle do do go um, through the park and do eat the grass and wherever. So there's they're not large herds, but there's occasionally you come across these cows who seem quite mystified by humans. Also in the area, there's a, the jay, a different kind of jay than um, we used to, obviously, uh, the Mexican jay, um, different fly catchers. Uh, dusky caps, dusky fly catches, gray. The trouble is these guys all look the same and I'm sure, I'm sure I've got some that I haven't identified because I know they're a little different, but uh, so, so hard to identify, particularly for an intermediate birder. Um, again, in July, um, when I was there, the yellow-breasted chat was around. There were quite a few of them in this particular area and also the hepatic uh, tanager uh, against a female. But uh, all sorts of different birds. There's also barrack wrens. There's also a few of the ones. One of the things that amazes me down there is when people see a spotted towie, they go into raptures. And uh, it's, it's hard not to go. I have three of those in my yard uh, every day. Also in that area, uh, Western Tanager, uh, Black-throated Gray Warbler, and a uh, number of kingbirds. Uh, this is the Cassins, also saw a tropical. Um, I don't have pictures of it, but uh, yeah, numbers of kingbirds down there, uh, particularly at the height of the summer. So that's the Patagonia area, and now I go into the Bisbee Sierra Vista area. So this is Bisbee, and uh, if you do travel to southern uh, Arizona, I, 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 I do like Bisbee. Um, it's, uh, this is the upper town, and you can see the buildings are all uh, older. It, it formed in the late 1800s, 
they pulled off a vast amount of minerals out of there. Um, it was formed in 1877 um, by a, a won an army scout who was uh, with the army uh, chasing Apaches, uh, got off his horse and saw there were some minerals and came back and then um, the rest is history. Um, they've mined out of this one um, 7 million ounces of gold, 8 billion pounds of copper. Uh, they've also had silver, zinc, and it was worked until the mid 70s. A population at one time was 10,000 people. It's now around 5,000 people. So most of the um, buildings are fairly old. Uh, this is the upper town, which would be on the higher side of the mine. And this was this is the lower town, which is on the other side of the mound. And uh, here, the this, this is a bit of a historic district. You, you can see there's old cars parked there, wonderful breakfast place. And this place up here was my hotel uh, in Bisbee. I just wanted to show you that I didn't always stay in uh, trailers. I did, this was when I was by myself in uh, July. Just north of uh, Bisbee is a place called Tombstone, uh, which if you're into tourist traps, is, is will be wonderful for you. Uh, they have gunfights, I think, on the hour every hour. They have stagecoaches going through town and enough tourist stuff to make you want to bath. But quite famous, 26 miles north. If we go to the west, in between Sierra, uh, Sierra Vista and Bisbee is the San Pedro River Reserve. And this is the San Pedro River. It, it is marked as uh, a major river in the, um, in the area. And uh, the one on the left is the pond. There is a pond area which dries up in the summer. But you can see the cottonwoods, large cottonwoods, because it's fairly wide, it does support a, a fair amount of, of vegetation. Here, the grey hawk, um, this is a, is a, the grey hawk is here and also over in uh, Patagonia. I've seen one in the, in the park. They're not, they're not too common. The Inca dove, fairly common but it's a different uh, dove from the regular kind of dove, smaller dove. And, and then in the, uh, near the um, entrance, there's uh, some co old cottonwood trees that are bits fall off and a Western screech owl uh, took residence in uh, one of them. Neat. A few buntings uh, go in and out of there. There was a lark bunting. Uh, in and out of a feeder, the very bunting when you got the female, but the, the lens, lazuli bunting. Uh, seen that a uh, number of times there. Also uh, passing through, because it shouldn't be that low, it, it was the painting red star. They tend to like uh, higher elevations. And, uh, oh, there's my tropical uh, kingbird. And uh, also I captured a fight. Um, Val was talking earlier about things fighting. I, I never thought I'd see a hummingbird in a verdin. It's like a chickadee and a hummingbird having a fight. But these guys were going at it, and they went at it for a couple of minutes before the uh, verdin took off. This was a real thrill for me. Uh, Marlene and I were down there one fall, and... Uh, we spotted, I didn't get this thing quite in focus, but it's good enough. I spotted a Sora and then uh, they're going, oh, I think that's a Sora. I think it's a Sora. And then, and then I saw another bird and I said, oh, look, Marlene, there's the female. Remember that I'm an emerging birder. And then it took about 30 seconds to realize that it was two species that they don't have different size beaks. Even I'm not quite that stupid. So. Anyway, that was a real thrill because it was the first time that I'd seen either of them. It was like, ah, a Sora and a Virginia rail. And then they got together. And I, to actually have a picture of a Sora and a Virginia rail in the same picture was like, wow, look at this, look at this. And they paddled off and they were wide out, quite out in the open. We were quite close and they didn't seem to bother at all. Normally, both of them are very skittish and very um, 
reticent to come out, but they were wide open and it was an incredible day. I talked about the Lucifer uh, hummingbird. This is where I saw it. This is um, just south of, just south of uh, Sierra Vista there is a number of canyons. There's Ash Canyon. Uh, they got one named after Terry. There's Carr Canyon. There's um, uh, Ramsey Canyon. There's a number of them. And at the bottom of Ash Canyon um, was a B and B. And this is Mary Jo here. Uh, Mary Jo, a little eccentric, uh, but she would spend about $10,000 a year on bird feed. And she had large numbers of bird feeders out. You can see that there's only four hummingbird feeders here, but there was basis for more. And then this is just as you're going in and then at the back of her house, uh, you can see the people up here looking into her garden. Here's Marlene in one of the seats. She had about 30 seats. And uh, you put $5 into a jar per person as you walked in. I think that's gone up to $10 now. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, 2019, Mary Jo passed away. Uh, she was quite the character. She'd sit out and talk with you, and it was it was always fun going there. I must have been there half a dozen times. Um, I haven't been there since, but apparently uh, the family wanted to sell it on. They wanted the money, and they did a GoFundMe, and they managed to keep it going. And then a sponsor um, stepped in and bought it, and so now it's run as a sanction. I think they charge you $10 to go in. And it's probably set up the same way that Mary Jo had it. You just go in, um, you can't take a tripod, but you can go in and sit in one of the chairs and large numbers of birds come through and some fairly unique birds um, coming through this one. The Lucifer hummingbird is the bird that everybody uh, or certain people want to see. Um, but there's other birds uh, around there too, and I just have a few of them here. There's the Arizona woodpecker is a is a very frequent one. Um, Green-tailed towhee, uh, Mexican jays. Uh, there's um, turkeys coming through. There's nuthatches. There's uh, multiple di different uh, birds. So there's the nuthatch. There's another bird I've got to learn how to pronounce. Uh, I wish they I wish they name them things that are easier, like Chris's bird. It would be a lot easier for them. So I only put a few of the birds in because um, if I put birds and places, we just go. We just be here all night. Another place, um, and this this one again, you have to pay to go in, is a nature reserve, a Ramsey Canyon. Um, you get there early in the morning. Very limited parking, so you have to go. Uh, nice trails up. Uh, always something different in here. I haven't seen vast numbers of birds, but those that I've seen have been very interesting. Um, Gilded flicker, the crew grosbeak. This sulfur belly flycatcher was really interested in. In the uh, last, in the July, I was walking through, just north of that hut that, that I had the picture of, and there was a flash uh, came in and a flurry, and this sulfur bellied um, flycatcher came buzzing in, almost hit the floor, and then went up into a tree, and that's where I took it. And it was fairly close to the trail, and he was being chased by this guy, and, and he escaped. But the remarkable thing was, well, both of them, one was on one side of the trail, I'm in the middle, and this hawk is on the other. And you can see how clear this hawk is. It, it was very close. I had, at that time, I had my big lens, so I had to get it down to 200 millimeters and walk backwards to get the thing in focus. That's how close it was. But a uh, nice picture of a hawk, a nice, interesting thing. And they were only about, let's say, 10 feet from each other. One sat on the perch and one sat on the floor, both, I guess, recovering from their chase. Um, it's amazing what you can see in nature when you just wander around. Also there, there's some Orioles. 
um, is the hooded oriole. Um, neat, neat birds. I've also seen this one up at uh, Asayampa. Um, Madeira Canyon, I know that Peter's been there. This too is, uh, you see, water is everything. And here we have um, some tree, different trees. There's oak trees within this. Uh, here are the uh, some uh, vultures from that area. I stayed in Madeira Canyon one time, and and he, here were the uh, vultures uh, sunning themselves before they took off in the morning. Very common white winged dove, but I figured I got to get the doves in. I'd forgotten all about those, and when I was there, staying there, a uh, northern pygmy arrow came in and sat. This too is somewhere where you can sit out. Um, there's a lodge there in Madeira Canyon and they put a lot of feeders out and you can sit on the benches there and watch it and different things come in. And this guy was not actually in the canyon. He was actually up there in the trees uh, with all the other activity. Uh, that was a neat sighting. A lot of turkeys coming through. I found out that there's um, something like five million wild turkeys in the U.S. And you'd think, with the number of guns they have in the U.S., that there wouldn't there wouldn't be a turkey living, but but they are. There in the south, there's quite a few. And uh, Madeira Canyon, there's a flock of about ten come through. As with Ash Canyon, there's a flock of about six come through. Uh, beautiful colors on these uh, birds. This is an incredibly interesting bird. Um, we were on a call the other day. Uh, interesting, I, I mean, I took a picture of this bird and, and then getting ready for this talk, I thought I'd do a little bit of research. And uh, we were on a call the other day with the Cascade Bird Box guys. And Jack brought up this woodpecker that lives in families and does all these wonderful things. And that was remarkable because he'd just seen a video and I just read about this thing that day. And so this is the acorn wood woodpecker. It lives in Southern California and also Southern Arizona. And it likes uh, oak forests. It likes to um, be around oak because 50% plus of its diet is acorns. And what it does is it makes a hole and puts the acorn in. And there are pictures I've seen of trees with 50,000 holes in them, all very close together. The small picture I have has just got a few holes. But what is, what's remarkable about these is, and each hole will have a have an acorn and they try to get to fit the acorn to the hole so it's hard to get out so other people can't can't steal it so they go around checking to see if it's it, if it's easy to pull out or not then they try and put it in another hole but they go this is a very communal bird they go in family groups of about 10 to 16 the prime family group is three females and seven males and they tend to have one nest. And so the first female goes in, lays its eggs, the second one goes in, and before it's laid its eggs, it, it turfs some of the eggs of the other female out, but it stops doing that when it starts laying eggs. And then the third one comes in and it lays eggs as well. And so it can, they can be up to um, uh, 16, 17 eggs in these nests. So, if if a male can't find another group to uh, join, uh, they stay with the family group, but they don't get to play families. They just worker, they just workers. Their job is to drill the holes. Takes about twenty minutes a hole, and put acorns in. And so, and these holes that they have are gener multi generational. So. You know, these these holes could have been made by the great great grandfather and, and so on down. So seven males, three females, which is why they seem quite plentiful, because when when you're around and you see an acorn woodpecker, you don't just see one, you seem to see a few of them. And that's that must be the reason. I just thought it was because they were common. 
So I didn't ever known that unless it had been for the, this presentation. That the, and I'm surprised that there hasn't been a documentary about this particular uh, woodpecker because they're quite fascinating in their behaviors and how they operate as a group and uh, how they work. So we're getting, for those of you that are starting to fall asleep, we're getting towards the end of this. And uh, just a few more. Uh, the canyon towhee, bridal titmouse again, something that's in the south. For us that see juncos, there is a yellow-eyed jun yellow junco. They tend to be again in, in that uh, southern Arizona area. And of course, it wouldn't be right without um, uh, without a roadrunner. Roadrunners, you see when you're least expecting them. Uh, there they are. You have to be quick with the camera because they they do actually move quite fast. They they do fly as well as run, but they they do run qu quite fast. Uh, kind of an iconic bird for uh, Arizona. I must have seen them a dozen times, but always when you're not expecting them. Some again in the area hepatic tanagers. You know, nice colourful birds. And uh, to end up with this is the uh, Scots Oriole. So uh, that's it for the um, presentation. There's, there's so much more. And I've got to thank uh, Jean Gardner for uh, pointing me to one or two places and uh, also for her enthusiasm of the area. It really uh, rubs off on me. But there's new places and there's a lot of new birds uh, to be seen. And I got now I'm interested in more than birds, uh, thanks to the uh, brochures we've been doing. There's all sorts of new lizards and butterflies and dragonflies and all sorts of other things. This picture is uh, the, the, um, the bird that a lot of people go after. It's the uh, elegant tro trogon. Um, and I haven't seen this. It does. It is in Madeira Canyon. It is in Ramsey Canyon. It is in a number of areas down there, and it should be not easy to see. But I should be able, if I put my mind to it, in a couple of days, I should be able to see one of those. That would be a good quest. So I, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope um, I got across what I enjoy about the the area. Um, the uh, fascination, and as I said before, that the, having the birds that are in that Sibley's book um, adds some excitement to me because it's 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 our reference book and it's the way we go. So, thank you very much for listening, and thank you, uh, Chris. I'll uh, hand you back over. Thanks, Chris. It was great.